Uh, I'll start off, so we're, I'm going to tell you a little bit, because we have this captive bat colony, and we have been working uh, with big brown bats, the white rat of the bat world, as I like to call it. Um, my students, uh, in, you know, what I'm going to talk to you today is work done by my students in the lab, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, I'm traditionally an animal behaviorist or a, a neurobiologist, and because we have access to pregnant female bats and they give birth, in the lab when we rear their young and, and can do studies on the young. And we have this very unique uh, opportunity situation. So I want to tell you a little bit about some work that we've done. And my apologies to my laboratory and some close colleagues who may have seen this presentation, albeit uh, at the, uh, a few months ago in Texas. Uh, so first, I want to acknowledge the, the folks who actually uh, did contribute the work, including a collaborator. Uh, Carl Lyons is a, a graduate student. Heather Mayberry is a former grad student who uh, did her master's with me and did work on vocal development in young pups. And, and um, she then went on to do a PhD with John Ratcliffe uh, after working with Craig Willis as a bat care technician for some time. And Doreen Mokel is a former postdoc in the lab who did the work on hearing that I'm going to talk to you about. I also want to acknowledge the lab photographers, uh, Brock Fenton and Sherry Fenton are always very generous to come to our, my lab, take pictures of me and my students, and of course, mostly take pictures of the bats. And almost all the pictures you're going to see today are thanks to a Brock and Sherry Fenton, such as these pictures here. So for example, we've been able to work uh, with bats that have newly given birth. We've got uh, pregnant bats. I'm not sure if we have an actual pregnant bat in here, but here's newly given birth. All the young pups. And you can see some of these photos, the pups, have their toenails painted. There's a good example. Uh, my students, you know, they get to do four years of a bachelor degree, and then they get to learn how to be, how to give a manicure to a bat, a pedicure, and uh, paint. We, we keep track of the, which pups go with which mums until they're old enough to actually put a tag on them. So, you know, here's another example of painting toenails. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we have, we're very fortunate, so I want to say thank you to McMaster because we have Canada's first and only captive research colony of insect, insectivorous bats. And uh, hopefully some of you will get to see um, the colony. Here's what a pregnant bat looks like. So uh, uh, later on, you're going to hear uh, a presentation by my grad student, Alexa Clark. She's giving a poster on the calls emitted by pregnant bats uh, before and after they give birth, actually. And you can see these two giant lumps under, on, the, on her back. Those are, uh, those are her buns in the oven. And this is a couple of uh, shots of the same female. You can see we've painted the toenails of this pup. So the young are born, the females turn upside down for them, right side up for us, give birth into their tail membrane pouch. And the first thing the pups have to do is they have to crawl up and find their mother's teat to, you know, to get milk. Uh, and that's that's a, a huge moment in their life. Uh, and then when you find a bat that's got pups Quite often you see it's like a vampire with a cloak around uh, the victim. She has her two pups, one on each teeth, under her wing membranes, and she'll be crawling around with those pups attached to the teeth. And in the colony, the bats tend to live uh, under towels. Sometimes they're under these wooden things. There's actually a little bat right there. They have the access to water and food trays. They have a little outdoor opening. They can crawl to a little bit of a flying area, so they have some uh, outdoor space. It gets cold in the winter, it gets warm in the summer, uh, and we've had in-house breeding, and we have some plants and stuff that we move around randomly just to keep their echolocation uh, systems engaged. Uh, and then there's a little picture of the outdoor area. We took down this jungle gym recently, <clears throat> but um, when our first colony was first built, there was a little dirt trail here, and people parked. Now this is the front entrance to the university. You all, you all came in this way. So we had to put a fence up and planted trees uh, just to keep out any unwanted customers. And I want to thank Lucas Greville for uh, this video. Uh, so in the colony, if, I'm fo if we're filming from the outside area looking in, uh, you can see this bat room for the bats to fly and move around. And um, obviously these guys were a little bit disturbed uh, but when they were being filmed. So just going to tell you quickly to tell you about some development in general, morphological. Uh, an anatomical development, how the vocalizations change during development, and talk a little bit about how the hearing changes during development. And there's a face that not just a mom could love. I'm sure most people in this audience could love 
a picture of a bat pup. So this is what a one-day-old bat pup looks like. Uh, it's just attached with its milk teeth, and actually you can see the milk teeth very nicely in that photo, uh, attached, and you can see it's got giant forearms. It comes out of the mum, you know, it's, it's all wing. And you can also see it's got these really, really sharp claws that it comes out of the, the birth canal with. Uh, so, you know, if you're a bat mum, you have to deal with uh, a puncture wound, maybe. And it kind of reminds me of that 19... Uh, uh, 70s movie, It's Alive, for those of us who are old enough to remember that It's Alive, you see the nice clawed hand coming out of the crib here. Uh, there's only one thing wrong with the Davis's baby, It's Alive. This is a picture of me in 20 years from now. Uh, <laughs> and, and you can see, uh, so the bats are born naked, their eyes are closed, their ears are closed. But one of the cool things working with Brock, when he's really, and Sherry, they're particular about lighting, is when the lighting's right, look at this face. Look at the hairs all over the face of the bat. The sensory hairs, we have no idea what they're doing. Uh, and, there's, and there's young facial glands are developing like here, and there's one here. So the, you know, there's lots of sort of undiscovered uh, questions still. So, you know, what could they be, could these be used to find the mother's teeth? Are they right away active for doing this? Because their eyes are closed. Uh, so this is a, a two-day-old pup. Uh, here's another picture of a different two-day-old pup. You can see very nicely the milk teeth. You can also see uh, um, that it's still there's very little, very sparse hairs have come in. This pup's eyes have started to open, but you can see the ear is still closed. And in fact, the tragus of the bat, which is this part of you and I, it's folded right back in, and it's covering the external auditory canal. Now, these pups are producing vocalizations. Anyone who's worked with bats knows they produce eye, eye calls, isolation calls. And that attracts the mother's attention. Help, I'm cold. Help, I need food. Help, I've wandered away. Uh, come retrieve me. Um, but uh, the hearing is, was an aspect of, uh, you know, sort of what can they hear at different ages. <clears throat> Here's a three-day-old pup, which really nicely shows how the bats are all wings, like Popeye. And uh, again, you can see very nice, sharp front claw. They come out right away. They're able to climb on the mum. And you can see they're starting to see a little difference in coloration between the dorsum and the ventrum, and they're starting to see some hairs coming in, and the melanin is, <clears throat> is starting to come in. But you can see also this pup, its tragus now is starting to fold out of the ear, but the ear canal is still sealed by a skin. A six-day-old pup, now it's starting to grow into itself. You know, the forearms haven't, they're, they're still changing, but the pup's getting bigger. Here you can see the tragus has popped out. This pup still has its ears closed, but the, the fur is nice and uh, sparse. It's no longer sparse. It's coming in dense. It's very fine. Uh, here's an eight-day-old pup. Now it's starting to get more coarse hair is developing. Its face is starting to look much more like an adult bat. It's not quite as pointy. Uh, and you can actually see uh, uh, nice features of the face popping in, including the glands of the, of, around the, the, the snout. The eyes are open, and in this particular pup, the ears now are open. You can see the tragus right there. And the ears are starting to be erect more often. Here's a nine-day-old bat. Now you can still see very clearly it has milk teeth. The permanent teeth are starting to erupt, but the milk teeth are still there. And just as a, qu a quick quiz, I know, can you guess the sex of this bat? I'll give you a hint. It's right here. <laughs> Here's a six, so I'm jumping now from day nine to day 16. There's lots of things we can talk to you about. But now, even by 16 days old, this pup is looking relatively adult-like, although it's still a good 10 to 14 days away from its first flight uh, and being able to even think about catching insects with echolocation. Very, very sharp, bright white teeth. Uh, so it haven't, hasn't really been used much yet. Um, and so even though it looks adult-like, it has a, still quite a ways of trajectory to development to go. Just some data, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on data to show you. These are wild-caught values here for adults, and here is a pup trajectory for the growth of the forearm and for the change in mass. Uh, the pups can get a little larger uh, than adult bats in captivity. They have unlimited access to food, of course, once they are weaned from their mothers. The auditory canals. The ears, you'd be surprised, this is when the first ear opens. There's no difference between males and females. There's the postnatal day. But you can see there's a bit of variation. Ears are not really, the first ear is not even opening until day five, six, seven on average. And then the second ear opens uh, a little later. And it's not like it's a left and right thing. It's just that the ears don't open symmetrically. They tend to, and look, in some cases, 
The second ear doesn't open until 11 days of, of age. So we're thinking that they're probably not doing a lot of auditory discrimination tasks for the first five, six, seven days of their life. Um, another thing that pups tend to do when they're hanging, uh, when they're growing, is they'll hang off the substrate and they'll practice flight. They'll practice flight and they'll raise themselves up and hang on with their, with their claws. This helps to build the motor coordination, the sensory uh, aspects. They coordinate breathing with flight. So here's an example of a pup just doing that right in the lab. Some of the vocalizations emitted by the bats as they go from very young stages where they're emitting almost all these type one vocalizations to there's different types, and this is just meant to be a slice of a few types of vocalizations that isolated pups emit when there's no other individual present. But eventually they start emitting solely these type three vocalizations, which are the biosonar. Here's some interesting social-like vocalizations, and this is sort of a transition maybe between these long duration isolation calls, which are used to attract the mother's attention, lots of harmonics, to these bio short duration, this is all on the same scale. So these are only three to four or five milliseconds long. And just we can quantify how the harmonics change, they decrease over time, and how the, the interpulse interval changes. And I won't, won't bore you too much with those kinds of data, but one of the coolest things is that pups, this is a 32-day-old pup and its mother, uh, and we found evidence from this even before, well before day 32, is they start to emit these groups, these pulses of calls. So this is frequency and time. This is the amplitude, so each one of the calls here is here. And then this is the interval between calls shown here. So we have short interval, longer interval, short intervals. And they start producing these groups of calls with very short intervals. We call them sonar strobe groups. And the moms, of course, are doing it. And we think that this is with the first evidence that pups are now starting to insonify their environment and starting to perceive their environment. And they investigate or interpolate their environment with a series of short calls, all at the same repetition rate. So they expect the echoes to all come back at the same rate. And they can, they can just focus on what the echo is doing rather than the delay of the echo, which, you know, the delay would be related to target range. A little just quickly, if there's still time, do I have time for, okay, auditory development. So uh, we, we can study, uh, we study hearing in the lab a number of ways. Uh, but the, one of the more recent ways we've been doing it is with, is with recording auditory brainstem response or AVRs. And we use these very fine needle electrodes that we can just insert under the skin of the bat. So we have two electrodes, one for each auditory bulla, which is the bulla are located on the vent surface of the skull eventually. And the, as you can imagine in bats, echolocating bats, the, the uh, auditory bulla are quite large and the areas of the brain devoted to hearing are quite large. So these are just subcutaneous electrodes. The bats are wrapped in very scientific uh, equipment. We use a pantyhose that former lab participants can donate to the lab and they, they're just nice and cozy. Uh, the young pups don't even need to be anesthetized, but as, the old, as they get older, they, we do have to give them a little tranquilizer to, so they don't move around. And then we can, oops, then we can play sounds from the speaker here at a distance, and we play sounds and we can record the evoked response, and we do this over and over and over and over again, and the evoked response tends to average, and the noise tends to cancel each other out. So it's an averaging system, so you need to have the Subjects listen to the same stimulus for quite a few repetitions, like 250 times. Uh, this is a nice, because it compared to other techniques that we've used in the lab, it's much, uh, it's very minimally invasive, hence it can be repeated in the same animal, so you can study things like development. How does the hearing change as the animal develops? And it yields information on the gross functioning of the peripheral and central auditory system, but we don't get any information on what single neurons are doing. For that, we have other techniques. So this is a picture of a 10-day-old bat uh, already starting to be recorded with this technique. And uh, my current, currently in the lab, my graduate student Shane Swelt, along with my postdoc Kazuma Hase, are using ABRs and single unit recording to studying hearing in bats. So here's an example of how the threshold of hearing of a bat changes from day 10 up to one month, two months, three months, and even one year later. And this dotted line shows a behavioral tuning curve so animals that are trained to respond to sounds, you can measure their hearing thresholds by their behavior. These are adults. You can see that the pups, we, we don't even start recording to day 10 because their ears don't even open until day 7 or 8. Uh, both ears may not even open until day 11. And each one of these is a factor of 20 dB 
For those of you who don't know dB, that's okay. This is a factor of 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. So you can see thresholds change by a factor of 1,000 to 10,000 over a relatively short period of time, and their bandwidth. We hear in this range here, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. If you're really young and haven't been to too many rock concerts, you can hear up to here. Look at the hearing range of the pup. It expands by an order, uh, uh, sorry, it expands by a factor of five over the course of the first 30 days of life. So we've done other aspects to study hearing, but I just wanted to highlight just hearing thresholds. Hearing thresholds are just that's only one factor. We haven't studied things like myelination, circuit formation, and you know, circuits can take a while to develop. Maybe auditory circuits for processing echoes continue to develop two, three, four months of life. So what are we studying in the lab now? Well, one of the things we studied recently, this is uh, my student, uh, Renata Simolsi, who I think is here now. Renata, there she is. Uh, she'll be part of the tours as well. So I was introducing everybody on the tours. How does the ear or pinna change during development? This is a project Renata did. Uh, as an undergraduate during COVID uh, with a cell phone. Uh, how does a pup's vocal, ve vocal beam change with development? We can measure how the sonar system of the pups uh, changes as they age. And wh what age do pups begin to perceive targets with echolocation? Uh, so this is Renata's work just showing the development. She measured how the surface area of the ear changes, how the tragus length changes. And then this is just a, a line normal halfway through this line. And this is just showing you data from the tragus. So this, what I think is remarkable about this, this was all done holding pups by hand with a cell phone to take the pictures, uh, all, mostly by herself because it was during COVID, so nobody else could be in the room with her. And uh, these are her data from her, her cell phone photos. These are the shapes of the tragus length in known age bats from the lab. And you can see that the pups, uh, tragus doesn't get to adult proportions until about this stage when bups are making their first flights, their developmental milestones. How does a pup's vocal beam change with development? We've been studying this in the lab. Carl Lyons has been doing it, and I'll have some new people doing it. So we set up a microphone array in our behavior room, and you'll get a tour of this today. And bats can sit on this platform here, and they can be adult bats, or they can be pups. Here's a picture. Oh, we do this work in collaboration with our colleague Lasse Jakobsen from the University of Southern Denmark. Uh, and so the pups or, or adults can sit on the platform and then they're emitting calls. You see the bat's mouth opens up, chirp, chirp, chirp. And he's picked up by this microphone so we can measure the spatial extent of the sonar beam horizontally and vertically and um, the sound pressure level. And when we do stuff like that, we can get data. So here's a two-day-old pup, a 24-day-old pup. You can see the two-day-old pup is emitting its isolation call. It's used to attract its mom. And these are the echolocation calls of the 24 day old pup, this is the same animal. And here is what the, uh, the sound pressures look like for these different calls and the beam shape. And it's all normalized onto the central axis. Of, so this microphone right here at the center, there's microphones here and microphones here. And you can see the sound pressure level falls off as the, as the sort of the pressure to the side of the animal. But you can already see that the yellow dots are extend more, they're, they're wider out versus the, the, the purple asterisk, which tends to be more focused. And this is only at 24 days old when the animals still aren't even flying. So the idea is we think that the pups are learning to control their sonar beam and focus the beam so they can focus it and aim it at targets because then they can move their heads, of course, and focus on a target here or focus on a target there. And each one of these little contours is a, is a, a halving uh, of, of energy. So you can see the energy is halved already at 30 degrees relative to in front of the animal. So again, just like eyes, we're, we're binocular creatures. We see straight ahead best, but bats are also seeing with their ears in the forward direction best, and they're getting less echoic information from the side, which actually might be an advantage. You don't want to have a bunch of clutter coming into your auditory system. At what age do pups begin to perceive target with echolocation? Stay tuned because I don't have any answers for you at this stage. All right, I want to say thanks to everyone because it did take a lot of people uh, produce this work, and I'm happy to take any questions. And here's a beautiful picture of a lactating female big brown bat that Brock took in the field during COVID when we were doing a filming with W5. Thank you.
both be on, I guess. Okay, so uh, I'm Derek, by the way, moderating this session. Uh, we do have time for some questions for Paul. And if anyone wants a special request, more bat noises, he'll be performing all day. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry, before we do this, I just want to say for the live stream, um, the people on the live stream can't hear you unless you speak into the mic. So for presenters, when someone asks a question, we're just going to repeat the question into the microphone. So. Do I have an interpretation for the U-shaped curve? Yes. So it, the sensitivity is that the lower the values, they're more sensitive. So the hearing thresholds are highest. You're least sensitive at the ends of the frequency range. So low frequencies are where the bats are least sensitive, very high frequencies. And then they have, you know, there's some variation, of course, but that's their sweet spot. And it turns out in the big brown, that's right in the 50 to 25 kilohertz, the fundamental portion of their FM sweep, the frequency modulated sweep. Sorry, I'm using jargon. In the back. Loud, please. You had mentioned that uh, the big brown, like the black baby mothers, they, their calls will change after they pop. Is, do you, is there a reason why their frequencies change? change? The pups calls, are, sorry, the, as the question was asked about the change of the calls of the mum, I think is what you asked. So the mums may change types of vocalizations that they produce when interacting with their pups. That's not what was shown here. Just, I was showing you the change in the call of the pup as it's developing. And they, and they switch from using multi-harmonic, long-duration signals to using much more, uh, with a lot of just constant energy at every one frequency, even though there's lots of harmonics. Then they tend to switch to using frequency modulated, <laughs> sweeping high to low in frequency, because that's what they use as their chirp for actively echolocating and perceiving targets in the world. Does that make sense? Thank you. Christy. Uh, what percent of the time do your mothers? Oh, what percent of the time do your mothers give birth to two young versus one? Thank you. That's a great question. So most of the time, the bats that we work with give birth to twins, um, and they are fraternal twins, although they could be uh, uh, identical. But we know that from field work that they can often be sired by different fathers too. The twins. Now, that's a genetic thing because most of the big browns east of the Great Divide give birth to twins, and west of the Great Divide, they give birth to single pups. And it's very, you know, I've ca caught bats in North Carolina and brought them to Seattle, and they still give birth to twins. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks very much to Paul. So, that was a great way to kick off our conference with the host and a great presentation. Now we're actually going to